Hi, this is Frank, and welcome back to The Next Realignment. In this episode, we are going to be talking about how Franklin Roosevelt embarked on a radical new agenda for the Democratic Party with the First New Deal, a progressive program to combat the Depression by raising prices. Over the next two episodes, we're going to be talking about how Franklin Roosevelt created the New Deal, which means we're going to be talking about how Franklin Roosevelt created the political philosophy that's come to govern the Democratic Party ever since, and created the political divides that have divided American politics and American culture ever since. And that political philosophy, of course, is New Deal liberalism, or often as shorthand, simply liberalism. Because... The thing is, political liberalism in the form that we know it today, it really didn't exist until 1932. And that's because political liberalism in the form that we know it today isn't even really one idea. What we call this one ideology is, when you kind of peel off the label, in fact, sort of a hodgepodge, a collection, an alliance of different ideas and values that we've packaged together at a certain time and place to deal with a certain set of problems. And then got into the habit of seeing it as one big thing and losing sight of all of its constituent parts. It, it takes the tools of progressivism, this idea that we can use expertise and social science and policy and planning, and we can use them to actually plan and design progress. And it weds that to this idea of populism, that we can take sort of a policy that helps working people and the least well, well off. So... Liberalism then becomes an ideology that holds that we can use expertise and policy to plan a better society that it works well and benefits working people and the least well off. This story of how Franklin Roosevelt created the New Deal is how this new ideology that we take for granted, how it came together. And it's really important to understand it because you need to see where the fault lines are within our political philosophies today, if you want to understand what's going to happen when eventually this party system reaches its end and we start having to plot out what's going to happen next and how they're going to break apart and how their constituent parts might come together in our own future. In this episode, this first of these two episodes, we're going to be focusing mostly on what we call the first New Deal, on the early years of the New Deal. So Franklin Roosevelt now becomes president of the United States he is responsible for this crisis, this national crisis, not just an economic crisis, but a crisis of legitimacy for the American Republic. And he has to figure out what to do. And the thing with FDR is he wasn't himself really what you would consider a policy wonk or really much of a policy guy at all, nor was he an ideologue. He wasn't sort of a revolutionary or a radical, somebody who had spent a career sort of in the world of ideas trying to push new radical uh, innovative ideas on the world. He'd always been sort of an establishment Democratic Party politician of the fourth party system era. Uh, he, more than that, he was sort of a guy who was known, uh, he ran for office based on his personality and pragmatism and competence for office. But he was also somebody who did take policy very seriously. He knew it was important and he knew now that he had to do something radical and new and serious and meaningful if he was going to solve this crisis. So he got together the smartest minds that he could find. He went out and he found the academics and policy people and the best and the brightest, and he assembled them together into a team in his administration, a team that came to be called his brain trust. And the thing is, because he was looking for the smartest minds he could find, he wasn't being doctrinaire in his choices. He wasn't looking for established Democratic Party operatives or people with even Democratic Party backgrounds. He was looking for whoever he could find who had ideas on what to do to solve a crisis. And that meant by nature, a lot of the people he pulled from, uh, some of them had a lot of progressive backgrounds and even Republican backgrounds, which stood to reason because the progressive movement after all was a movement about using policy and planning and expertise and social science to solve public problems. It was also a movement that had flourished among the middle classes and the uh, upper middle classes, among the professional classes, among academics and elites. 
just the kinds of people who were likely to have the expertise that Roosevelt now desperately needed. The group, it changed its membership over time. It started out with uh, sort of centered around Columbia University. It had people like Rex Tugwell or uh, Adolf Burl. Over time, it kind of shifted to Harvard. He started looking at people like uh, Felix Frankfurter. He also had a lot of people, sort of uh, policy minds in his administration, people like uh, Francis Perkins or Harold Ickes or Harry Hopkins. And this team of, of thinkers, he then tasked them to do whatever they could come up with, no matter how radical, to try to solve this crisis of America. They tried a flurry of different things, lots of different proposals, but all of them were sort of linked by a sort of a common philosophy on what these New Dealers thought the source of the problem was and what was likely to be the source of the solution. And that common philosophy was not counterintuitively to what a lot of people think, Keynesian economics. See, John Maynard Keynes, he was an economist, he was working around this time, and he developed a theory, a theory that the way to solve an economic downturn like the Depression was that the government should spend a lot of money to inject money into the economy, to create a fiscal stimulus that would then sort of prime the pump and get the economy moving again. And Keynes, his ideas were starting to get known at this time. Some of the New Dealers, uh, they were aware of him. Some of them even spoke with him. And ultimately, if you look at what was the result of a lot of the New Deal programs, a lot of it did involve Keynesian stimulus, which is why this idea, this association between the two has set in. But the thing is, you have to remember, is while that might have been the effect, that wasn't what the New Dealers thought they were trying to do. The New Dealers, they had a completely different sort of economic theory in mind when they sought to develop the New Deal. See, what they thought was at the core of the problem was price, that prices needed to get higher. This was a popular economic theory at the time, and it basically worked like this. What they thought was that the problem in a depression is that firms don't have enough money to put people to work. If firms were more profitable, they had healthy profits, then they could raise wages and they could hire more people. So the goal of the government was to get firms more profitable. And the way that you would get firms more profitable is you would eliminate competition between firms because competition between firms drives down prices. See, if you've got the more uh, nimble and effective and efficient firm, it puts pressure on everybody else in the industry. They then have to adapt to your practices and the ones that can't, they go out of business and therefore jobs get lost. And if they do adapt to your practice and they get more lean, that's still gonna probably mean that they hire less people. So what you wanted to do was to get everybody to relax and instead of running as fast as the fastest horse, you wanted to them run as slow as the slowest horse because that way everybody would be making money and they would all have comfortable profits and they could people to work. So the goal of this first New Deal, the early years of the New Deal and this program that uh, they came up with was a coordinated effort to raise prices and reduce competition. There were a lot of programs, but there were kind of two crown jewels of the first New Deal. The first of these was an agricultural program and the second was an industrial program. And the agricultural program was called the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. And its goal was to reduce the supply of agricultural products, namely food, because to the New Dealers, they wanted prices to rise. So they thought there was too much food on the market and there was a surplus of food, which was driving down prices, so farmers were going bankrupt. So what they wanted to do was destroy some of this food. And they created this coherent program where what they would do is they would get farmers to destroy excess crops, plow over fields, leave fields fallow. They would spike fruit with kerosene. They would slaughter pigs and they would reduce the supply of food, which was, of course, controversial at a time where a lot of people were literally going hungry. The program worked more or less as advertised for large farmers, because if you had a lot of land, you would leave some of it fallow, farm the rest, and you'd make more money. But it was turned out, of course, it has to be said, it was bad for small farmers, particularly sharecroppers who rented their land from the larger farmers. Because what the larger farmers would do was simply take the land that they were going to rent to the sharecroppers, take that land, and that's what they would leave fallow while they farmed the rest. And it meant sharecroppers, particularly a lot of African Americans across the South who were making their living now as sharecroppers, they didn't own their own land, 
Now they had no land to farm at all and they were left more destitute. The other program that was sort of the other centerpiece, probably the most important, was the National Industrial Recovery Act or the NRA, creating this agency, the National Recovery Administration. It was a big, powerful new agency. It was headed by a military general by the name of uh, Hugh Johnson. And the idea of the NRA was to eliminate competition between firms. So the government would create sort of cartels, quasi-cartels within each industry. They would get the most powerful members of industry, the most powerful members of the labor movement, and uh, officials from the government, and they would form boards. And these boards would be appointed for each industry in America. And the boards would create sort of regulations on how you could create your products, how you could go to market, the prices that you could sell them, sort of in minute detail, govern how uh, you had to conduct your business and the prices that in which you could sell. And the idea was, as we discussed, to keep everybody on an even playing field. That if there was uniform rules on how to produce the products and everybody was doing the same thing, then hopefully everybody would stay in business. The program was technically voluntary, but sort of effectively mandatory. Because uh, if you participated in the program and you followed your NRA codes, you got this blue eagle that you could display. Uh, uh, it's a placard with the American blue eagle, and you would put it up either in your store or put it on your products. And the government did a very good job of a PR campaign to tell every American to boycott anybody who refused to display the Blue Eagle because they were unpatriotic and they weren't doing their part to solve the Depression. As you might imagine, this first New Deal was sort of a shock for the Democratic Party because it was a real break from traditional Democratic thinking. Traditionally, Democrats, they hated bigness. They hated bigness in all things. This had been going back to Thomas Jefferson. They hated big government. They hated big business. They believed in sort of decentralization. They believed in states' rights. They didn't like big infrastructure programs. Even when Woodrow Wilson came out with his progressive agenda, his new freedom, the point of it was it was bottom up. It was opposed to the Republicans' progressive new nationalism of Teddy Roosevelt that had government regulations of the economy. Under Wilson's idea, no, the government would be a scalpel that would come in and fix individual problems and otherwise leave the market to fix problems. But now under FDR, the government had thrown its hat into the hands of bigness. And a lot of populist Democrats thought that this was a betrayal of everything their party had ever believed. And particularly that it was now working with the people who were running the businesses of America and it had turned their backs on the little guys who the Democrats were always supposed to be for. And these Democrats found their champion in the political boss of the state of Louisiana, Senator Huey Long. Huey Long had started Roosevelt's term as an ally, but by now he's running around the country and he's attacking Roosevelt. He's attacking him as a rich guy in bed with his rich friends. He's got a useless program of the first new deal instead of a program that's going to help working people who are desperate and need us and help. And Long, he has an alternative program. He has a program that he's come up with that he calls share our wealth. It's meant to, as he put it, make every man a king. And his program, it's very different from this first New Deal program. What Long wants to do is he wants to put a cap on income, uh, the income of millionaires. He's going to uh, create an old age pension program. He is going to create a minimum income for everybody. He's going to create free college tuition. He has a bunch of programs to redistribute money to working people who are hurting in the Depression and to stick it to rich people and millionaires. As he's attacking Roosevelt, Roosevelt and the New Dealers naturally panicked because we're heading now into the election of 1936. They're pretty sure Huey Long is gunning up to challenge him for the Democratic Party nomination, and they're thinking he very well might win. And so it became time to pivot. It became time to come up with a new New Deal program, something very different from the first New Deal. And they were going to come up with what became a second New Deal, where the first New Deal was a progressive program to raise prices and coordinate the economy. The second New Deal would be something very, very different. It would be a populist program meant to head off Huey Long. And that is what we will be talking about next. Thanks a lot for watching, and I hope you tune in to the next episode because we're going to be talking about the second New Deal a populist program to head off Huey Long that completed the transformation of the Democratic Party.